Introduction to The Fern Lover's Companion A Guide for the Northeastern States and Canada by George Henry Tilton, A.M. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lisa Reichert Introduction Thoreau tells us, quote, Nature made a fern for pure leaves. End quote. Fern leaves are in the highest order of cryptogams. Like those of flowering plants, they are reinforced by woody fibers running through their stems, keeping them erect while permitting graceful curves. Their exquisite symmetry of form, their frequent finely cut borders, and their rich shades of green combine to make them objects of rare beauty while their unique vernation and method of fruiting along with their wonderful mystery of reproduction invest them with marked scientific interest affording stimulus and culture to the thoughtful mind by peculiar enchantments these charming plants allure the ardent nature lover to observe their haunts and habits oh then most gracefully they wave in the forest like a sea and dear as they are beautiful are these fern leaves to me as a rule the larger and coarser ferns grow in moist shady situations as swamps ravines and damp woods while the smaller ones are more apt to be found along mountain ranges in some dry and even exposed locality a tiny crevice in some high cliff is not infrequently chosen by these fascinating little plants which protect themselves from drought by assuming a mantle of light wool or of hair and chaff with perhaps a covering of white powder as in some cloak ferns thus keeping a layer of moist air next to the surface of the leaf and checking transpiration some of the rock-loving ferns in dry places are known as resurrection ferns reviving after their leaves have turned sere and brown a touch of rain and lo they are green and flourishing ferns vary in height from the diminutive filmy fern of less than an inch to the vast tree ferns of the tropics reaching a height of sixty feet or more reproduction ferns are propagated in various ways a frequent method is by perennial rootstocks which often creep beneath the surface sending up it may be single fronds as in the common bracken or graceful leaf crowns as in the cinnamon fern the bladder fern is propagated in part from its bulblets while the walking leaf bends over to the earth and roots at the tip ferns are also reproduced by spores a process mysterious and marvelous as a fairy tale instead of seeds the fern produces spores which are little one-celled bodies without an embryo and may be likened to buds a spore falls upon damp soil and germinates producing a small green shield-shaped patch much smaller than a dime which is called a prothallium or prothallus on its under surface delicate root hairs grow to give it stability and nutriment also two sorts of reproductive organs known as antheridia and archegonia the male and female growths analogous to the stamens and pistils in flowers from the former spring small active spiral bodies called antherozoids which lash about in the moisture of the prothallium until they find the archegonia the cells of which are so arranged in each case as to form a tube around the central cell which is called the oosphere or egg cell the point to be fertilized when one of the entering antherozoids reaches this point, the desired change is effected, and the canal of the archegonium closes. The empty oosphere becomes the quickened oospore, whose newly begotten plant germ unfolds normally by the multiplication of cells that become, in turn, root, stem, first leaf, etc., while the prothallium, no longer needed to sustain its offspring, withers away. Fern plants have been known to spring directly from the prothallus by a budding process apart from the organs of fertilization, showing that nature, quote, fulfills herself in many ways, end quote. 
vernation all true ferns come out of the ground head foremost coiled up like a watch spring and are designated as fiddleheads or croziers a real crozier is a bishop's staff some of these odd young growths are covered with fern wool which birds often use in lining their nests this wool usually disappears later as the crozier unfolds into the broad green blade the development of plant shoots from the bud is called vernation latin ver meaning spring and this unique uncoiling of ferns circinate vernation veins the veins of a fern are free when branching from the mid vein they do not connect with each other and simple when they do not fork when the veins intersect they are said to anastomose greek an opening or network and their meshes are called areolae or areoles latin areola a little open space explanation of terms a frond is said to be pinnate latin pinna a feather when its primary divisions extend to the rachis as in the christmas fern a frond is bipinnate latin bis twice when the lobes of the pinnae extend to the midvein as in the royal fern these divisions of the pinnae are called pinules when a frond is tripinnate the last complete divisions are called ultimate pinules or segments a frond is pinnatifid when its lobes extend halfway or more to the rachis or midvein as in the middle lobes of the pinnatifid spleenwort the pinnae of a frond are often pinnatifid when the frond itself is pinnate and a frond may be pinnate in its lower part and become pinnatifid higher up as in the pinnatifid spleenwort just mentioned the divisions of a pinnatifid leaf are called segments of a bipinnatifid or tripinnatifid leaf ultimate segments sporangia and fruit dots Fern spores are formed in little sacs known as spore cases, or sporangia. They are usually clustered in dots or lines on the back or margin of a frond, either on or at the end of a small vein, or in spike-like racemes on separate stalks. Sori, singular sorus, a heap, or fruit dots, may be naked as in the polypody, but are usually covered with a thin, delicate membrane, known as the inducium, Greek, a dress, or mantle. The family or genus of a fern is often determined by the shape of its inducium, e.g., the inducium of the woodsias is star-shaped, of the dicksonias, cup-shaped, of the aspleniums, linear, of the wood ferns, kidney-shaped, etc. In many ferns the sporangia are surrounded in whole or in part by a vertical elastic ring, annulus, reminding one of a small brown worm closely coiled. As the spores mature, the ring contracts and bursts with considerable force, scattering the spores. The spores of the different genera mature at different times, from May to September. A good time to collect ferns is just before the fruiting season. Helpful Hints the following hints may be helpful to the young collector. 1. A good lens with needles for dissecting is very helpful in examining the sori, veins, glands, etc., as an accurate knowledge of any one of these items may aid in identifying a given specimen. Bosch and Lom make a convenient two-bladed pocket glass for about $2. 2. Do not exterminate or weaken a fern colony by taking more plants than it can spare. In small colonies of rare ferns, take a few and leave the rest to grow. It is decidedly ill-bred to rob a locality of its precious plants. Pick your fern leaf down close to the rootstock, including a portion of that also, if it can be spared. Place your fronds between newspaper sheets and lay dryers over them blotting paper or other absorbent paper. Cover with a board or slat frame and lay on this a weight of several pounds, leaving it for twenty-four hours. If the specimens are not then cured, change the dryers. Mount the prepared specimens on white mounting sheets. 
the regulation size is sixteen and a half by eleven and a half inches the labels are usually three and three quarter by one and three quarter inches a sample will suggest the proper inscription herbarium of john doe ophioglossum vulgatum l adder's tongue willoughby lake vermont august nineteenth nineteen eleven wet meadow collected by x y z rather common but often overlooked place the label at the lower right hand corner of the sheet which is now ready to be laid in the genus cover usually of manila paper sixteen and a half by twelve inches it is well to jot down important memoranda at the time of collecting this is the method in use at the grey herbarium in cambridge it can of course be modified to suit one's own taste or convenience the young collector can begin by simply pressing his specimens between the leaves of a book the older and coarser the better and he can mount them in a blank book designed for the purpose or if he has only a common blank book he can cut out some of the leaves alternately with others left in place as is often done with a scrap book that when the book is full it may not be crowded at the back or he can use sheets of blank paper or of any uniform size and mount the specimens on these with gummed strips and then group them placing those of the same genus together such an extemporized herbarium though crude will serve for a beginning while stimulating his interest and advancing his knowledge of the ferns let him collect press and mount as many varieties as possible giving the name with date and place of collecting etc such a first attempt may be kept as a reminder of pleasant hours spent in learning the rudiments of a delightful study we cannot insist too strongly upon the necessity of handling and studying the living plant every student needs to observe for himself the haunts habits and structure of real ferns we would say to the young student while familiarizing yourself with english names of the ferns do not neglect the scientific names which often hold the key to their meaning repeat over and over the name of each genus in soliloquy and in conversation until your mind instantly associates each fern with its family name adiantum polystichum asplenium and all the rest fix them in the memory for a permanent asset with hard study and growing knowledge will come growing attachment how our great expert mr davenport loved the ferns he would handle them with gentle touch fondly stroke their leaves and devoutly study their structure as if inspired by the all-wise interpreter move along these shades in gentleness of heart with gentle hand touch for there is a spirit in the woods end of the introduction to the fern lover's companion a guide for the northeastern states and canada read by lisa reichert